today I'm going to read begin the reading from my first book, which is a product of my PhD research. I'm doing this reading because a lot of what is happening in Nigeria today um, make me remember the research and the claims made in the book. Also, some of the history of what happened because a lot is being bandied about on uh, post-colonial history. This research is not on the entire post-colonial history of Nigeria, but on the history of Nigeria between 1983 and 1993, which is the historical period when the structural ad adjustment program was imposed on Nigeria. And for most people who don't know, the Structural Adjustment Program is a neoliberal supposedly rescue program for countries that have unsustainable debt that approach the International Monetary Fund or IMF for debt relief. The IMF then goes into rescheduling the debt of the countries. And as a result of arrangements made in terms of the financial and um, financial architecture of the world in the 1980s, the World Bank also got involved in rescheduling the debt. I'll tell some of this history in the book. This is going to be many parts because the book is single spaced and it's over, it's almost um, 250 pages. Actually with the appendices, it's over 300. So this book was published in 1998 by the University Press of America. Um, and the title is A Sapped Democracy, The Political Economy of the Structural Adjustment Program and the Political Transition in Nigeria, 1983 to 1993. And the author is myself, Moju Baolu, Olufunke Okome. I did the research while I was a PhD student at Columbia University. And since I want to do the entire book, I'm going to begin with the acknowledgments. This book is based on my doctoral dissertation. Thus, it encompasses not only my ideas and methods, but benefited from comments and suggestions from friends, such as Dr. Ehiedu Iweriebo. Dr. Iweriebo is now Professor Ehiedu Iweriebo. And Dr. Joseph Caruso, who is now the African Studies Librarian at Columbia University. These men were very helpful. When I was writing my proposal, a very painful and long process. The study group that we belonged to was one of the bright spots during my years at Columbia University. Both Ehiedu and Joe were part of the group of first PhD students who found structural adjustment programs worthy of concerted study and analysis. 
and thus organized the 1990 Columbia University Institute of African Studies sponsored conference that conceptualized structural adjustment as an instance of multilateral imperialism. The conference was well attended. It helped me to become even more focused on the study of this phenomenon. My advisors, Professor David Baldwin and Dr. now Professor Deborah Brautigan were very helpful and supportive. Other people were not. <laughs> I could not have done this work without the substantial support system provided by my family. I thank my husband Moyo, Dr. Moyo Okome, for providing an atmosphere that enabled me to concentrate on my work. I was able to make prodigious use of the copier that we could not have purchased without his hard work and the telephone to conduct some of my research. Moyo introduced me too, to Mr. Alison Aida, who was the first to ask me why I wasn't focusing on democracy in combination with the Structural Adjustment Program. Mr. Aida graciously gave up about four hours of his time for an in-depth interview on the causes and consequences of SAP in the Nigerian political economy. My interview with him went far into the night and gave me an insight that was profound and broad. I also thank Mr. Aida for the gift of the book that he authored, Reflections on Nigerian Development, which was published in Lagos, Nigeria by Malthouse Press in 1987. Moyo also introduced me to Chief Philip Asiodu, who similarly gave me one of the perspectives of the Nigerian business sector on the same question that I asked Mr. Aida. With him, I learned a lot as well. Moyo introduced me to Mr. Gamaliel Onosote, who was also gracious enough to spend more than, than the agreed upon time in an interview with me. In addition, Moyo made sure that I got in touch with Dr. Sam Aluko and requested an interview on my behalf. Unfortunately, logistical problems prevented this interview from taking place. When I interviewed General Olusegun Obasanjo in New York, Moyo also took the day off from work and videotaped the interview. For all the interviews, Moyo acted as my research assistant, working the tape recorder, driving me to all my appointments and keeping me from becoming despondent when things did not go as planned. Moyo, the honor and respect that you gave to me then and always is much appreciated. My children, Moyo and Kenny, are literally, literally, you are the salt of the earth. They make life richer and more meaningful. The Yoruba say of children, Omonide, children are bronze. That is, they are durable, lasting, and valuable. The Lafarge Society of Jesus postdoctoral research fellowship at Fordham University in the 1996-97 academic year facilitated the finishing touches 
that I put into the work. I thank Dr. Jerome Conti, Assistant Vice President at the time for administration at Fordham University for providing me with all the institutional and logistical support that I needed for the duration of the fellowship. I thank him for convincing me to accept the offer of the fellowship in spite of my initial reluctance. My colleagues at the Department of African and African American Affairs, Dr. Mark Nason, Dr. Claude Mangum, and Dr. Mark Chapman helped me in numerous ways to make my association with the department fruitful, both in terms of scholarship and professionally. In particular, Dr. Mangum mentored me and showed me in practical ways how to utilize all the resources that Fordham University offered to my advantage. I have some wonderful friends <laughs> who have been good for me. In this respect, my perpetual friend, Dr. Oyeronke Oyeumi, now Professor Oyeronke Oyeumi, is one of a kind. She encouraged me to go on and complete my dissertation when I was most discouraged. When I got the contract for publication in the summer of 1997, she infused an excitement which I lacked into the fact that this book should be put out immediately so that I could go on to the next thing. I also uh, appreciate the efforts of my friend, the Ashiwaju, Dr. Nkiru Nzegu, for being supportive and encouraging both intellectually and otherwise. Friendships. My parents provided the background for my being. They inculcated in me a belief in myself. They taught me that confidence and humility combined keeps one's feet on the ground and one's head in the right place. They made me a well-rounded person ever before I stepped into the world of scholarship. My mother, Segilola's efforts during the last stages of writing my dissertation proves the Yoruba saying, Iyani Wura, mother is gold, accurate. In acknowledgement of her help, I hereby give a rendition of just a few snatches of her, of her family's oriki, orile. The epic poetry with which the Yoruba honor individuals, both great and small. Each family has its own distinctive oriki. It provides an insight into past ancestry and specificities of each family's connectedness to the society. It also inspires people to greatness. Oriki is just one example of the skill of orature that the Yoruba corpus of intellectual works encompasses. My mother was a great woman. She surprised me constantly with her grasp of politics when she was with me in the US. She told me many stories about the early days of contact between the West and Yorubas, both among the Oyo, her people, and the Ijebu, my father's people. She's a walk, she was a walking encyclopedia who read constantly 
and never suffered fools gladly. So if people see this in me, you know who I resemble. First, a part of the Yoruba version of the Oriki and then the English translation. Omo Padijo Koroboto Biu Igbe Adio Onita Bajila Ro Kagbale Baba Foni Foni Oni Bile Babeni Bang Beni Atun Yile Baba Eni She Oma De Yemi Alo Wolo Du Koroboto Biu Ode Gungo Tinri to me to me. O de baba la o la woni. O mo lo fu ja. O mo akiti o lu. O mo eni bo kwenye bo de. O mo eni anke gege. Ni yo bara. Ni no je. Baba o la woni. Ikuru me lo ju. Oro mo ju. Oro mo jo bo. Egun ori asha alo olodu igbo ade o omo loni ayin eni kan ko je yin onita na onita na o se nkan fun ni omo osopale ani ogun eni owo baba re ba bato ko lo tun se Omo ji loru, tan roro, o beri ri lo pin. Omo a she peri, a lo lo du. E gun bori a sha, oro mo jokbo. Omo un ju kokoro, omo kori koti o po jure, omo kpagbo je kpagbo ta. E yala gori o bodo wi, po ba wi, she ni baba o lu bodo un kpa won je. Omo a bi di bebe, be le be le be. Ele be yon son koun e be. Omo, olu bo don son koun e di e ton ton. Here's the English translation. Offspring of a party job. Thick and substantial like the anvil. Adio the storm said, When we wake up in the morning, we ought to sweep the floor. Father, the spotless one, he said, if one's father's house favors or supports one, one ought to take care of it. Offspring of Adeyemi, the fabulously wealthy one. Thick and huge like the anvil, the hunter of the delicious lava, who walks around with water. Olawanyi's father, the immaculate hunter, offspring of the wealthy and proud one. Offspring of Akitiolu, offspring of the elephant who resides in the ocean and shoots with a bronze gun. Olawanyu's father, the offspring of one who is overly spoiled and would make one unhappy. Death confuses me. Alowolodu of Adio Forest, the masquerade who carries off the head of the hawk. Only the owner of today is praised, that is, those presently in power. No one dares praise the owner of yesterday, that is, the ex-powers that be. The owner of yesterday did nothing for us. The offspring of the full moon, who challenges anyone whose father can to reach up to the moon to repair or modify it. Offspring of one who wakes up in the night, the star, the tiny star that lights up the dark. Alowolodu, offspring of the bright star who brings peace. Masquerade who carries off the head of the of the hawk. Offspring of the wilderness of insects. Offspring of the unsightly grass. Offspring of they who slaughter and eat rams, who slaughter and sell rams. Something the owners of the rams must not comment on. If they do, 
what Olubodun's father does is to kill and consume them. Offspring of they who sit so prettily on other people's cultivated mound of earth. The cultivators cry over their damaged cultivated mounds. Olubodun's offspring cries hard over her or his bottom. The duty of a scholar is to record phenomena as well as go under words as they appear to reveal the multiple layers of meaning. A scholar must interrogate words, problematizing them. The Yoruba has killed at this. Considering this brief and incomplete exposition of my mother's family oricurile reveals that one cannot take words as they appear. To do so is to fail to grasp their deeper meaning. The Yoruba say, Owele shinoro, boro basonu, owele finwa. That is, proverbs are the horses of language. When horses are lost, one seeks them with proverbs. The Oriki Orile, like the Owe, is a useful bearer of deep multiple meanings. This particular one shows to someone who is an expert that my mother's people are Yoruba nobility. They are kinfolk of the Allah of Oyo, that is the traditional ruler of Oyo. They therefore took a lot of liberties. They showed little concern for the property of others, except to the extent that they could use them. And they brooked no opposition. However, being wealthy and the owners of today that is in power at the time, people praised rather than condemned them. There are deeper meanings in this brief rendition. I shall leave their revelation to a later time and work. My sisters gave me unlimited room and board, took care of my son, Moyo, while I did my research, drove me to so many places in order that I could do my research and were always ready to listen to my problems and advise me. My late brother, Benga, delivered and, que and collected questionnaires to those whom I could not interview personally. I could always ask him to scour Lagos for one book or the other, and I got results. My cousin, Dr. Solomon Atunda Olani Yon, now professor emeritus, went above and beyond the call of duty to make my research possible. We went together to conduct interviews and convince many reluctant people to complete questionnaires. A lot of these would give me a base for future work. My father, sacrificed a great deal to give me an excellent educational background. And at the last stage of writing my dissertation, encouraged my mother to come to the US and help me with my new baby, Oluwafe Ikemi, for one full year. I cannot thank him enough. I thank Mr. Alison Aida, Chief Philip Asiodu, General Olushego Obasanjo, Mr. Gamaliel Onosode, Chief Iji, Mr. Eburajolo, and others, too numerous to mention here, who gave up their time to speak with me on the issues of democratization and the structural adjustment program in Nigeria. Finally, I thank Bill Zara Zurat and Dave Thoma of Fordham Graphics for the work done on formatting this text 
Dave in particular impressed me with his professionalism, dedication, and selflessness. This book would not have been in such good shape without his work. So, um, I'm going to skip <laughs> the table of contents um, because, you know, when I read each chapter, we'll find out what the chapter is about. Um, I also think I have a um, piece about two of my siblings that passed away. Um, so... Indulge me while I look for that. Um, okay, here we go. It's in the dedication. To the memory of my sister, Mugbolade Olukemi Odulaja, and my brother, Moronfolu Olubenga Odulaja. The Yoruba say of our kinfolk and close friends, any or show me, people are my clothing. You both went to the sphere of the ancestors so prematurely that the length, breadth, and expanse of my clothing is much reduced. I'm thus more exposed to the elements more vulnerable as rest in peace so let me now go to the first chapter of this book chapter one of the book is the research objective sap and the return to civilian rule and introduction. In this chapter, I take up the questions that drive the research, the argument that I'm making, and I ask and try to answer the question briefly. Why do countries undertake dual transitions? That is, political transition to democracy and economic transition to capitalism. And then why do transitions fail? Then I give a summary of alternative views on dual transition. I talk about my methodology, the limitations, the conclusion, the organization of the book. Then I give definitions of the key terms, political liberalization, democracy, the structural adjustment program and transition, political, um, okay. So that's what I do in the first chapter. And it's um, extremely long, so I guess, I will maybe just do a few pages, maybe talk about the question, the argument, and then um, the other parts will come up subsequently. So chapter one, the research objective, SAP and the return to civilian rule and introduction. Here are several quotes. And apart, three, three of them, as a matter of fact, apart from the immediate and all three quotes were by General uh, Ibrahim Babangida. At the time when this dual transition was going on, he was a key player. So here, apart from the immediate and more viable problems of salvaging our battered economy, our other task is to bring about a new political culture, which, like a veritable fountainhead, would bring forth a stable, strong, and dynamic economy. 
A national crisis has many aspects, economic, political, and social, which interact. He also said, market-oriented reforms may be based, oh, well, here's a critic, <laughs> or SAP. Market-oriented reforms may be based on sound economics, but they breed um, voodoo politics. So let me just refer to who said that. This is Adam Jaworski, I think he's late. In Democracy and the Market, politi Political and Economic Reforms in Eastern Europe and Latin America, in a book published by Cambridge University Press in 1991, page 186. Here's another quote, and it's not um, Babangida. However poorly the market is harnessed to democratic purposes, only within market-oriented systems does political democracy arise. Not all market-oriented systems are democratic, but every democratic system is also a market-oriented system. Apparently, for reasons that are not wholly understood, political democracy has been unable to exist except when coupled with the market, an extraordinary proposition it has to be, it has so far held without exception. The people who said this, um, the person who said this was Charles Lindblom in Politics and Markets, the World's Political Economic Systems in a book published by Basic Books in 1997, page 160. All right, now to my own words. On June 27, 1986, after three years of severe balance of payments difficulties, two military coups d'etat and stalemated negotiations with the International Monetary Fund, or IMF. Nigeria's President Ibrahim Babangida inst instituted an orthodox structural adjustment program, or SAP. The regime was given substantial World Bank support both in drawing up the program and in getting the approval of the IMF. The SAP was simultaneously undertaken with a program designed to return Nigeria to civilian rule under a democratically elected government. At the time, Nigeria looked as though it was headed for a successful dual transition. Many observers optimistically lauded the Babangida regime as the best thing that could happen to the country. Nothing could be further from the truth as events later demonstrated. The Nigerian dual transition was a complete failure. If it had been successful, a democratically elected government would have replaced the Babangida regime and a well-functioning market economy would have been introduced, which increased the welfare of the majority of the population. Nigeria's economy would then combine long-term growth with low inflation and low unemployment. On the contrary, even though elections were held, 
the Babangida regime canceled the results and changed the rules willfully on employment and underemployment were rampant. There was a steep decline in per capita income and real income, an increase in absolute poverty, declined agricultural and industrial output, rising food imports, capital flight, and drastic reductions in social spending, which contributed to increased levels of immiseration. In time, the Babangida regime also became highly intolerant of opposition and criticism. The conventional wisdom on the relationship between democracy and development in third world or global south countries is encapsulated in the quote, cruel dilemma, unquote, thesis, which contends that there is a trade-off between democracy and economic development, and that authoritarianism is more compatible with, a, with rapid economic development. However, another research tradition posits that democracy does not necessarily hamper economic development, but may actually advance it. Given the claim in Western policy circles, and by some theorists, that there is a positive relationship between liberal economic and political reform. Why did the outcome in Nigeria not live up to the expectation that economic growth and democratic government could be jointly achieved through the implementation of the SAP and the political transition program? If indeed SAP and democratization are compatible, how do we explain the use of authoritarian tactics to ensure the implementation of SAPs? Where authoritarian tactics are utilized, as in Nigeria, does the determination and commitment to combine SAP and a return to democratic rule by a military government necessarily translate into a successful transition to democracy and the achievement of economic growth and improved general welfare. Does the existence of powerful pro-democracy movements combined with expressed government desire to achieve a dual transition make the difference? If dual transitions are incompatible, what are the factors responsible for their incompatibility? Most importantly, can the developments in Nigeria from 1983 to 1993 be explained using any of the presently influential theories of political economy on dual transitions. Early in his tenure, early in its, its, its tenure, the Babangida regime published and publicized what it identified as the beneficial aspects of SAP to drown out the voices of its critics. It also promised 
and early recovery for the Nigerian economy and a political transition that would surpass any previous one in Nigeria's history in its flawless execution. In June 1993, the regime canceled the results of the presidential elections, which was designed as the final stage of the political transition. This was after meddling with several aspects of the political transition, making and breaking its own rules with reckless abandon. By November 1993, the Babangida regime could not point to any concrete examples of recovery or steady progress toward democratically elected government. Babangida had become so unpopular and discredited that he was forced by the pressure of negative public opinion and numerous demonstrations to withdraw from office. Before long, the interim government that was left in charge collapsed just as rapidly as it had been created, having been pushed out by Babangida's former chief of army staff, General Sani Abacha. A period of political turmoil ensued and the country's economic problems continued unabated. The choice of a dual transition by the Babangida administration raises the questions that I ask in this book on the relationship between capitalist development and democracy, and more specific questions on why the dual transition was chosen and the reasons why it failed. The next section will turn to the examination of these questions.